Welcome to worship at Baptist Temple in Houston, Texas. We are so glad that you are joining us today online for this special and holy hour of worship. This is the 10th Sunday after Pentecost. We continue focusing on the life of the church and the reality of God in the world around us with an awareness of God's presence in all times and in all places. To those of you who are watching on Facebook, we warmly welcome you and we're so glad that you have found us. While you're there, we hope you'll like our video and share it and even leave us a comment to let us know that you are watching. If you do not have the worship guide for this service, you can read it on our website, baptisttemple.org. When you go to the website, why don't you go ahead and sign up to receive a weekly email that includes the worship guide, as well as a link to the video of this worship service. Sing the hymns with us. Pray sincerely with us. Meditate on the scriptures with us. And listen for God's word for you today. And now during the prelude, Prepare your heart and mind for worship by setting aside all of those things that may distract and center your mind on the things of God. Allow the veil to be lifted so that God's holiness may be revealed. The Old Testament reading today comes from Psalm 85, beginning in verse 8. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, 
One of my great privileges is the opportunity to officiate weddings from time to time. I just recently did one of these COVID-19 weddings where it was very small, but a beautiful and meaningful service. And it seems that no matter what the circumstances are, that, well, this passage that's commonly used in weddings like that is this quote from Jesus from Matthew 19, where he says that a man shall leave his father and his mother and be united with his wife, and that the two shall become one. The wedding vows that married couples take, they echo this sentiment. The words that usually come right before the, them saying, I do, they go something like this. Do you, do you promise to love her and respect her and comfort her and honor her and keep her? For better or for worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and health, forsaking all others, keeping yourself only for her as long as you both shall live. In, in other words, there are millions of other people out there, but I choose one. In saying yes to that one person, we have to say no to all of the other alternatives. And there is great joy and excitement in that kind of statement of affirmation. However, we have to also acknowledge that by choosing one thing exclusively, that we are saying no to many other options. So in essence, married couples are saying, I leave behind any possibility of being with anyone other than you. And I'm going to be with you wholly and completely. I choose you and only you, and it's not enough to just be me anymore. The two of us are become one flesh, joined together by God. And I wonder what might happen in your life and in mine if we started thinking about our relationship with God in these kinds of terms. One of the most common metaphors offered in Scripture, it makes us the, the bride of Christ. And I think we should see our connection to Jesus in this same light that faithful and, and happy married people see their connection to each other. In other words, there are millions of other options out there, but I choose Jesus and his way. I leave behind any possibility of, of, of devo being devoted to, to any other person or any other thing. I choose Jesus, him, and only him, wholly and completely. It's not enough to just be me anymore. The two become one flesh, like the Apostle Paul said in Galatians 2.20, where he says, I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. Join together with him and his will and by choosing him we have to leave behind lots of other options well this first part of this today's passage it helps us to to better understand this principle here we will see jesus modeling as he does time and time again his devotion to god one aspect of what that looks like always saying yes to God and, and no to all of the other options. Let's continue our journey through the Gospel of Matthew. This week will be in Matthew chapter 14, now beginning in verse 22. Immediately he made his the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. I want to contend here that this is one of those examples of Jesus saying yes to God and no to all of the other possibilities. And what is Jesus essentially saying no to here? He, he's leaving these options that exist for him at this moment. Other things could have happened. He, he could have done almost anything, but instead he says yes to God to, to find solitude and silence so that he can pray. He had already tried this once before, but the crowds had followed him to this deserted place. That's then where he fed the 5,000. Now he's dismissed these crowds again, and he's even sent the disciples away once more. 
And I think it's important for us to consider why does Jesus pray in this particular moment? Well, there's lots of possibilities that have been offered over the years. Some say that Jesus is, is really happy and giving thanks to God for the miracle that just took, pl took place when he fed the 5,000. How easy would it have been for, for Jesus to, to get high fives from all of the disciples as they boarded the boat together to head off to a, a new destination with new opportunities that would await them there. Instead, he shows his great devotion to God, perhaps in his great joy with what God has just done, finding solitude and silence to pray and perhaps give thanks. Some say in this moment, Jesus is actually really sad instead that he's received not too much earlier the news that John the Baptist had been beheaded. And we're not exactly sure what kind of relationship Jesus and John the Baptist actually had with each other. We know that they were cousins, but we don't know much more than that. If they were good friends, then Jesus has just lost a friend. If not, Jesus and John the Baptist they were part of the same movement of God, and maybe Jesus is, is really worried that John the Baptist's fate would be his fate. Perhaps Jesus feared his last days would be filled with suffering and death, too. Others suggest here in this moment that, well, <clears throat> this is just Jesus doing the thing that he always does, that it's his regular routine to go and pray. Perhaps it doesn't matter that there are things to do and places to go. Jesus is just this person who's devoted to God, and he's a person of prayer. And so on this day, at this time, he goes and prays. It's certainly not an isolated account in the pages of Scripture. Jesus, there's often recorded of instances of him getting away from all of the people and the distractions to go and pray. As I've already mentioned just a few verses earlier, in verse 13 of this same chapter, Jesus has already tried to, to go to a solitary place to pray. There's also instances like, just as an example, Mark 1.35, that says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up and left the house and went to a solitary place where he prayed. This kind of thing is stated about Jesus and his routine over and over again in the gospel. In other words, Jesus knew how to say yes to God and no to all of the other options. He knew how to be still and quiet to pray and to demonstrate his devotion to God. I find all of this so interesting because if there has ever been a person who could have just sailed through life on his own wisdom and his own strength and his own understanding, well, it was Jesus. We see here that even he needed to center himself in the presence of God. The Gospels make it clear that Jesus prayed and he prayed often, and surely we must need that same kind of thing. But the truth of the matter is that most of us really don't know how to do this. Instead of saying yes to God, we often say no to God and give ourselves away to lesser things. Being committed in this way, it takes a deliberateness that is difficult to possess because silence and solitude and prayer to God will rarely call out for our attention. Instead, we are compulsive and give in to our whims, unthinkingly giving ourselves to anything that calls out for our attention, even, even if it is nowhere close to being the highest and the best use of our, our time or energy. And our inability to control those tendencies, it hinders our ability to be still, and it hinders our ability to be devoted to God in prayer, and it hinders our ability to be a part of the things that God is doing in this world. Here's the bottom line. No matter what was going on in Jesus' heart and in his mind, he left everything and everyone, he left those things behind to go and pray. 
So whether you are happy and things are going well or you're sad and fearful about your future or even if there are many things to do and places to go, take time to get away from everyone and everything to pray. Because we identify our true devotion by the things that we do. We identify true devotion by the things that we allow to prevent us from following the kind of devotion that Jesus has modeled for us here. And if you never leave all of those other things behind, you may never actually figure out that Jesus really is the, the one thing that is completely superior to all of this other stuff that so often we devote ourselves to so quickly and easily. So how much space have you made in your life for spending time in prayer with God in silence and solitude? If Jesus needed this, then certainly we do as well. Let us pray together. Almighty God, we are people who are journeying through a dry and thirsty land. The cares, burdens, and responsibilities of our lives have sapped our strength and left us weary and worn. Our struggles have caused our resolve to waver. Our sin, they've obscured our vision of you. So with parched souls and hungry hearts, we come now to you, the fountain of life, for sustaining refreshment. We pray that you would give us the refreshment and renewal we so badly need. We have set these moments aside to praise you, to talk to you, to listen to you, and at least for a little while we leave behind the machines and the motors, the keyboards and the devices. At least for a little while we leave behind the brokenness and the sickness and the stress. We leave those things behind to find you and all of the things that come when you are near your love and your rest and your peace and your grace and your hope and in these moments we pray that you would refresh us especially our hope remind us that jesus christ our lord the giver of all hope has not been defeated by past events or our present circumstances we pray that this hope might give us what we need to replace our fear of what might happen in the future with your peace. And so we ask, renew our hope. In these moments, impress upon our hearts and our minds that the strength and the courage that we need, it comes from abiding in your presence. More able to face the challenges and the difficulties of our lives, more able to faithfully follow you wherever you may lead us. And because we're unsure of all of the right words to pray, we join our voices together and pray the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
My absolute favorite place in all of the world is, is probably Telluride, Colorado. We're very lucky because my wife's family has a house there and we get to stay there for free anytime we go. And honestly, the summertime is really our favorite time of the year to go as a family because we enjoy going on hikes and soaking up that cool mountain weather and taking naps during those afternoon rain showers. But there's also this four-wheel drive Jeep that is there at this house, and sometimes we really enjoy going to these remote parts of the mountain in these off-road trails. Many years ago, we bought a book that contains information about all of the trails in the area, and we made numerous excursions on these trails over the years. All of the trails in this book are rated on a scale from about 1 to 10 in difficulty, and well, many years ago, probably at least 12 by now, when my children were very little, we'd made a plan to, to go on a, one of these trail adventures one day, and I looked through the book and decided that we would go to Imogene Pass. It starts at 13,114 feet, and there's a 4,350-foot gain in elevation. The book said it was an, on, on an old mining trail, and there was an old mining ghost town about halfway. We'd previously done several trails that were rated three out of a possible ten without any problems or difficulties whatsoever, and this trail was rated a four. So I thought, this shouldn't be too bad. Well, apparently the difference on this scale between three and four is fairly substantial, like the difference between a, a BB gun and, a, and an atomic bomb. Most of the trail was fairly typical and easy, but there was one substantial section where the trail zigged and zagged back and forth across a long section of the mountain. This part was fairly nerve-wracking because the road was exceedingly narrow. and There was a very steep drop-off on one side. As well, it was a dirt, kind of rock road with lots of loose gravel that could easily cause you to slide off of the trail. However, just when I thought that the worst of it was over, that, well, this section of the trail, it ended with a very, very narrow hairpin turn with a very steep incline. E even if we had just been hiking this trail on foot, I, I would have been a little nervous and made all three of my kids hold my hands as we went around the narrowest part of the trail. If the trail itself wasn't nodding enough, there was someone else's Jeep just off the edge of the cliff to our right. The, the person apparently didn't make this tricky turn and their vehicle must have tumbled hundreds of feet down the mountain and burst into flames and the charred remains of this vehicle it served as a warning about the dangers of this particular moment. Well, I stopped our vehicle to evaluate the situation, and if there had been any way out of this, I would have taken it. Well, Shelly, my wife, was obviously more than a little nervous. She knew what I knew, that there was no place to turn around, and that previous section of the trail was, was so long and narrow that, well, going forward had been so tricky that there was no way of even imagining backing up all the way down it. So she suggested that she and the kids should just get out in case I didn't make it. We laughed about that moment for years. Essentially, she was saying, okay, Kelly, we love you and good luck to you, but the kids and I are going to stand over here and, and watch you die. It wasn't really the exact kind of words of encouragement and assurance that I was needing in that moment. However, the trail was so narrow that that wasn't even a possibility. On one side, there was a steep mountain going up. On the other side, there was a steep mountain going down, not even... Well, not even enough to really get a good footing outside of the vehicle on either side. Whatever our fate was going to be, it was going to be the fate of all of us. I considered just abandoning the Jeep, but 
we hadn't seen any other people on this particular trail all day, and we were in an area that was too remote for the children to hike out. Needless to say, in this moment, we felt pretty vulnerable. I don't guess I've ever been in another situation where I felt more exposed or afraid, particularly because it wasn't just my life that was on the line. Shelly and all three of our kids were going to share my fate too. Ultimately, the only thing that we could do was go for it. And so we did. With a crazy mix of adrenaline and fear and desperation, I took a deep breath and put the Jeep in gear, and I don't really remember much about what followed that moment, probably because the good Lord was kind to me and didn't want me to have reoccurring nightmares about that moment, but, but the good news is we somehow made it. As we listen to the story in the Gospel of Matthew, the, the basic question that it seems to be asking to us, it seems to me, is are you willing to overcome your fear? we look at what Jesus is calling us to do in our lives, are we willing to take a deep breath and cast our fears aside and follow the path that Jesus wants us to follow, even if it may seem a little crazy? Let's continue reading in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 14, now in verse 24. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against it. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. The disciples were probably a couple of miles from shore. They'd been fighting the storm for most of the night. And all they, although they were undoubtedly exhausted and cold and wet, this telling of the story it focuses on one supreme element, their fear. It's perfectly understandable that they were afraid. If the darkness and storm are not enough in biblical times, they, they believe the sea was home of evil spirits and demons. So Jesus' act of coming to them, walking on the water, it would, have, it would have definitely scared them even more. They intentionally, I'm sorry, they initially thought he, he was a ghost or perhaps a sea demon. This kind of thinking, it seems silly to us, but it was very real in their mind. However, I do think it's fair in some way to be critical of this kind of thinking because when they saw Jesus out on the water, they didn't immediately assume that it was him. You see, these guys, they knew him. They had seen him do spectacular things before. And at this point in the story, the disciples seem to have a pretty clear understanding that, that Jesus is something very special. Their first thought should have been, well, this is clearly something Jesus can do. I bet it's him. It should have been their first thought, but it wasn't, and it's usually not ours. We like to keep our understanding of our world and our Lord in understandable terms. C.S. Lewis says it's no good asking for simple religion because, after all, real things are not simple. In reality, especially when Jesus is involved, it's usually complicated and almost always something that you would have never guessed or expected. And when fear takes hold of us, when we are threatened by the situations that are overwhelming, we almost never think, well, this is clearly something Jesus could do. Maybe this is him at work in my life. However, the truth of the matter is that sooner or later, I believe Jesus will come to you and require you to believe that he is capable of doing something that we might otherwise think is impossible. And early in the morning, he came walking to them on the sea. 
That's it. It just drops that sentence into the story as if it were normal, like walking down the road or strolling in the park, just walking on the sea. No commentary, no explanation. In some ways, it sounds just so simple. But think about the underlying meaning of these words. Jesus came to them walking on the sea. The, the most important part of the sentence is probably easily missed because we're distracted by the, the dazzle and the glitter and the flashy miracle part where he's walking on the sea. But perhaps the most important part is that, well, some translations say Jesus went out to them. Stop and think about how powerful this is. Jesus went out to them. It doesn't really matter how he got there, does it? It matters that he was there. It matters that when they were afraid, he came. It matters that when they needed him, he was there. It matters that when the wind came up and the disciples were in danger, Jesus went out to them. He could have used a jet ski in the story. It wouldn't change a bit. The, the point is that he came to them. And just as Jesus came to those disciples on that day, Jesus comes to his disciples in these days. When the, the, the last part of your life that had some semblance of order flew into pieces and all had broken. You might not have been able to see him because of the raging storm, but there in the storm, he was coming to you. And when the world as we know it seems to be dissolving around us and we, we don't really understand how to live differently, we need to remember that Jesus is somewhere out there coming toward us. We might mistake him for something else, but he's there. When fear almost stretches your family beyond its ability to survive. Jesus comes to you. And I think that's where we find ourselves in this text. Not hoping that Jesus will come, not wishing that Jesus will come, but proclaiming that Jesus did come and proclaiming that Jesus has come to us in the midst of the difficult and stormy mo moments that we face now. Jesus went out to them walking on the water and he said to them take heart or take courage it's I do not be afraid and that's what is needed for you and for me is that this admonition do not be afraid so that we might find the courage to rally our faith so that we might find courage to have hope that his presence in the storm will actually make a difference in our lives Courage and I do not be afraid, he says. So I think you and I should do all that we can to get rid of our small preconceived understandings of Jesus and begin to understand who he really is and what he's really capable of doing. Maybe your first thought should be some of the things that are causing me to be fearful. Maybe this is Jesus doing, doing the things that only he can do. It's as simple as knowing that if you scan the horizon long enough and look hard enough that you'll eventually see him coming to you. Jesus says to those disciples on that day, when he says to these disciples on this day, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Earlier in this day, Peter probably just thought he was, he was along for a nice little boat ride, but, but Jesus had more in mind for him. He has more in mind for us. However, we have to get, get over all of the things that make us fearful. All of the things that keep us from recognizing him. We have to trust him enough to take those first important steps of faith in his direction.
Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, through the storms of life, you are with your people in the person of Jesus, your Son. Calm our fears and strengthen our faith that we may never doubt his presence among us, but proclaim that he is your Son, risen from the dead, living forever and ever. Accept these gifts we bring. Use them to the glory of your kingdom. For it is in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, the one whom we praise and adore, and in whose precious and most holy name we pray. Amen. We come now to a time of offertory, of giving back to God. We remember that all that we have is God's, and it is as an act of worship with joyful hearts and out of an abundance of riches that we return to God a portion of that with which he has blessed us. We know that these worship services are ministering to you and that they're keeping you connected to God and connected to each other. We need your support. Give today so that this work may continue and so that many, many people will hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Go now to baptisttemple.org to give online or mail a check to us at 230 West 20th Street, Houston, Texas, 77008. Online, you may set up a recurring automatic weekly or monthly gift using your credit or debit card. This is a wonderful way to ensure that your gift will continue to support this ministry in these uncertain times. Give cheerfully, thanking God for his blessings of light and life. And now during the offertory, devote yourself to God in heart and in mind and in spirit. part of our scripture reading this day is Matthew 14 beginning now in verse 28 Peter answered him Lord if it is you command me to come to you on the water he said come so Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water and came toward Jesus but when he noticed the strong wind he became frightened and Beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? 
When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, Peter is the only disciple in the story who initially overcomes his fear. He's the only one who leaves the safety and the relative comfort of the boat. He literally steps out in faith and comes to Jesus on the water. Peter's willing to put himself through whatever this experience might entail, potentially pain or suffering, even death, in order to be with Jesus. And listen carefully to what happens when Peter leaves this place of safety and comfort to be with Jesus. For a moment, he walks with Jesus on the water. And most of the time, I think we miss the point of the story here because, honestly, I don't think that the message that's communicated in this part of Matthew's Gospel is that if, if you just have enough faith that you can do absolutely anything. You can walk on water. You can overcome all of your problems in spectacular ways. Honestly, I, I do have a sense that that faith does help us in those moments, and it does give us the ability to overcome in ways that we could not without it. But I think in this story, in this particular moment, that, well, I think the point is that if we are daring enough to believe, despite all of the ev evidence to the contrary, what we'll find is that Jesus is there with us in the storm. We will all find ourselves in the dark and stormy nights of life, and it may feel like Jesus is nowhere to be found. But if you don't hear anything else in this service today, hear this. Jesus is with you in the darkness and in the storm. Psalm 139, 7-10 puts it this way, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will hold me fast. Jesus said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He's with us in the stormy and deep waters of life. He's there in the fearful and desperate moments. He's always there. We just have to be willing to get out of that place of perceived comfort and safety and be willing to go to him. James 4, 8 gives us an important encouragement here. It says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. For all of us, the memory of the boat should be long gone. He's come to us in the storm, and he's called us to join him. Why would we be anywhere else? He calls, and we must go. All of our attention focused on one thing, focused on him. Storms will likely rage around you. If you stay focused on him enough, you'll likely not even notice they're there. Just keep moving toward him. First one step and then another. Because every one of us is on that dangerous mountain road of life where we, we come upon a, a treacherous and dangerous past that leaves you vulnerable and afraid. Everyone is hurting or is about to be hurt. Everyone is fearful or is about to be fearful. And in these kinds of moments, in fact, in, in every moment, our, our need is limitless. But thankfully, no one understands you like the one who made you. And thankfully, no one loves you more than the one who came to give his life for you. He has a, a plan for you that, that may not be easily seen or easily understood, but he's made a way 
for you, even if it looks impossible. And I wonder how dark and stormy is your world. Whether it seems reasonable or not, whether it feels like it or not, Jesus is there in the midst of the storm saying to you, just as he said to Peter, come. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to set aside your fears, your, your doubts, whatever it is that might be preventing you from coming to Jesus and, and plunge yourself into what Jesus is calling you to do. Remember, we, we identify our true devotion by the things that we do. So how will you respond today?
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and grant you peace. May the Lord give you the grace to never sell yourself short, grace to risk something big for something good, and grace to remember that this world is now too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. Now may he take your minds and think through them. May he take your lips and speak through them. And may he take your hearts and set them on fire in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 